Hello, my friends. Hey, Scott. How's it going? <laughs> Welcome. I, I think I fell in. The ground These are here. deep chairs. <laughs> I feel really far away from you, Peter. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, <laughs> let's get started with what I'd like to begin with as we're talking about legacies is to kind of timeline your legacies to say, and to begin with, where did you begin in the field of trauma healing? He began where, long before I did, so he should. Be. We'll start with him then. Where did I start? <laughs> um, I think it started me, to tell you the truth. Uh, I suppose if I have to set a timeline, it would be at the middle of 19, mid 1960s. And I met Gabor actually uh, because uh, he'd written a book called uh, When the Body Says when the body, No, no, but When the Body Says No, but the other one about addiction, uh, The Realm of Hungry Ghosts. Yeah. And I recognize that as an important book. And so I basically twisted the arm of the publisher to publish that book. And so I co-published it with him. Uh, that's not quite what happened. So, uh, okay, okay, I'll go back to, should I tell you what happened? Uh, yeah, okay. no, absolutely. So um, I, was, I, I was in family practice and I began to notice that people got sick and mentally ill, physically ill. There was all this trauma in their background. Nobody had taught me any of this in medical school, naturally. Yeah, of course. And when I began to investigate the situation, I discovered Peter's work. So I knew about you long before you knew about me. Uh, 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 because, I mean, he was a pioneer when I was totally a novice to this whole subject. Um, then I did publish a book called When the Body Says No. And what happened was is that um, out of the blue, you contacted me. And you asked me to write a preface to one of your books, That's and crazy. I was totally, and I was, I was totally flabbergasted. This giant is asking me to write a preface to one of his books, you know. So I did, um, and then my book on addiction got published in Canada, right. and nobody in the states wanted it. Nobody, every every publisher passed on it. So I called Peter in desperation, yeah. and I said, "Listen, nobody." He says, "Let me talk to my publisher," and then Peter twisted his publisher's arms. To publish my book on addiction in the realm of hunger ghosts, which became a, the most successful book ever published by that publishing house due to Peter's influence. So that's what it happens. <laughs> I stand corrected. Yeah, I stand corrected. Um, actually, where did I start? Uh, in about 1966, more or less. Um, I'd been, uh, I realized that th there is a body. I realized that I had a body. I realized that I didn't know that I didn't have a body. And that's where I began. And, uh, I met a woman named Charlotte Selvers in 1965-ish. And a friend of mine, Jack, uh, a rain, she was giving a workshop for the monks at Casa, at uh, Green Gulch in uh, outside of San Francisco. So I went in to, he was able to get me in, even though I wasn't a monk, <laughs> never was a monk. And uh, so um, we did things like we walked around the room and we hold a stone in our hands and she would say, well, what's the texture of the stone? How, how does it feel? What does it have? The temperature about this. And this went on all day long. <laughs> Finally, in walking, I kind of caught a glance from one of the monks. And the monk said something like, uh, I asked him, uh, are you enjoying this? And he said, big headache. <laughs> So at the end of the day, uh, she had us laying on the ground, on the floor, and breathing in through our feet, this kind of thing. And remember, I'm a budding scientist. You know the feet don't breathe. I mean, maybe they smell, but they don't breathe. 
So, however, when we, it was at the sunset, we walked out from the church, because that's where it was, and just looked across the San Francisco lights and then to the Bay Bridge, and it was absolutely the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. Mm. So I realized something had happened. And that, in a way, began my, began my search. Mm. Uh, then in uh, a year or two after that, uh, I was experimenting with a group of men, mostly men, who had high blood pressure. So 10, 20, 30, even 40 uh, points higher. I mean, it's significant. And I worked out a series of exercises that I with the, with their bodies, working specifically with certain muscles in their necks, in their jaw, and so forth. And then often when I would do this, their uh, their blood pressure would drop 10, 20, 30, and even a couple of times drop 40. So I knew that something was happening. And then putting that together with my uh, encounter with Charlotte Selvers uh, really set me on my career. Then in 1969, I mean, um, what what... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. In 69, I, I was asked to see this woman who was suffering from severe panic attacks, horrible panic attacks and uh, agoraphobia to the point where she couldn't leave her house. And so she couldn't go anywhere without her husband. And anyhow, uh, she came in and I assured her that I was just going to help her relax some of her muscles. And I did. And when she came in, her her her, um, her 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 pulse rate was way high. I could see it from the carotid pulse. She was like about 130 beats a minute. And so I assured her that I was just going to help her relax. I tried. I did help her to relax. But what happened is her heart rate shot. It went down, but then it went way up. And I realized, oh my God, what am I going to do? And in that moment. I had an image of a tiger crouching, ready to jump. By the way, that's where the title from my first book, Waking the Tiger, came from. So, so anyhow, uh, sh uh, uh, she, uh, she uh, and I said, there's a, a tiger, run, escape, and uh, climb those rocks, climb those rocks and escape. But I could see her legs were just not really working and I encouraged her and I said something like I'm with you right I'm right here I'm right with you and then all of a sudden her legs started to move even uh, as she was laying on this uh, table bodywork table and uh, when at the end of the session um, I asked her what she was experiencing and she said well at first I couldn't run everything was just holding me back but then finally, when you encouraged me, I could feel my body begin to move forward, begin to come back, in, basically back into life. And uh, when I climbed the rocks, I could feel my whole body and I could feel power coming into my body. And when I got to the top, I looked down and the tiger was there, but I was safe. And the tiger disappeared. And then I saw myself when I was four years old and I had a tonsillectomy and the mask was, they, I was being held on by the doctors and nurses while they put this mask over my face, which caused tremendous suffocation. And I, when she was, I worked with her when she was 24. And so for 20 years, she had been trying to escape from being held down, and then she was able to do it. So in a way, that's where my search began. Okay. You. Come a long way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's kind of amazing to think here we are, you've, you've created this whole field, like you've just the, the amount of work you've created from that moment of going, oh, God, what do I do? Yeah. I love well, you. The part that maybe you haven't mentioned, um, but it is um, very salient 
uh, in your new book that's coming out oh, yeah, yeah. next month yeah, yeah. is your own personal experience. Right. And I, I think I have to say that for all of us yeah. who work in this trauma field, um, it's not just a matter of expertise based on our studies or clinical experience. It's very much driven by our own stuff mm -hmm. that we've had to work on all our lives. And um, um, I think we still are, aren't we? So, so part of it is certainly self-discovery, um, not just yeah. um, clinical work or academic studies. Yeah. And in your new book, you certainly talk about your own trauma. That's right. In a, in a more open, vulnerable way than I've seen you talk about yeah. it. Before. Yeah. What That's took true. you so long, by the way? Huh? What, what took you so long to talk about your own <laughs> stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I, that is an interesting question. <laughs> Actually, when I uh, started to write the book three years ago, it was not to publish a book. Really? It was really only to uh, excavate my past okay. and to try to put it in some kind of a perspective. Yeah. And, uh, and then a very good friend said you really should write this book for people for people who have been traumatized right because they can be inspired by that right and i thought no way i'll mm. never do it mm. and she said please just think about it please and so i thought about it yeah and finally i gave it to richard grossinger yeah and he said you're trying to do something that's nearly impossible mm -hmm. to reveal yourself, but to reveal yourself in a way that people that people will read it and will be supported by it, and it will take them to heal some of their traumas. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I did, and 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 now it's I, 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 amazingly that uh, three, uh, 150 of those books actually got shipped out here. So you can get them, and there are also cards to pre-order them. So anyhow, that was the beginning. And, um, and for the first time when I got to a large audience at, at uh, uh, Evolution of Psychotherapy, yeah. uh, I got up in front and I <laughs> couldn't breathe. Really? Yeah, close to it. Really? But I remembered that just before that, you and I had a lunch with yeah. the uh, the faculty, yeah. and and you and other people have written such incredibly beautiful, touching endorsements of the book and about me yeah. that I felt all of your support, mm -hmm. and I was able to be there and stay there. So, question: Have I done enough? I can answer that in the affirmative. Am I enough? That's still a work in progress. But, but you know what? A couple of things. Uh, first of all, I'm somewhat surprised by what you say because um, uh, because part of what I do is I talk about my own stuff all the time. And there's yeah. plenty to talk about. And uh, people just appreciate it because uh, they find that it yeah. mirrors their own experience. So I'm surprised the, the, the difficulty of revealing ourselves, I just think it's necessary. Yeah. And I, I, I also, in a therapeutic context, when you're yeah. a therapist, people are often asking me, well, how much should I reveal of my own stuff to my clients? And that it's not supposed to be professional to talk about yourself. I think that's nonsense. Uh, the, uh, if, if you're revealing to make yourself feel better or to get sympathy from the client, you shouldn't. But if you're doing it to make them feel mirrored and, and not so mm -hmm. strange Connected. in their so-called dysfunction, I think it's just a very healthy, and healthy thing to do. Um, there's another point I was going to make, but I forget what it is now. Um, so I'll, I'll let it go. Maybe it'll come back to me. But I think maybe you're really talking also about Chiron, yeah. the Greek archetype who I think I at least understand more now is uh, the wounded healer. Yeah. And we all come to our wounded healers. And in order to really be there for others, 
we need to come to peace with that with that aspect of ourselves. And um, I think probably more than anyone else, she really he really embodies that archetype that you were talking about. Yeah. The archetype that we do our own work, our own healing, because then we can be present in ourselves and present for the other, for the client. And then that reminds me of uh, the what I was going to say before. Um, <laughs> right. But in a certain sense, I don't find it difficult to talk about my own stuff because it's not personal. It's universal. It's just the human uh, ego and its woundedness. And it's not, there's nothing unique about it. There's nothing to be ashamed of, you know. But the other thing I was going to say was, we, you and I had this discussion a couple of years ago when, where you said that um, if you ask yourself, have I done enough? Mm -hmm. And it's true. If you and I hop to twig tomorrow, as they say, passed on to the Netherlands or whatever, um, we could say that we've done enough, that our legacy is fairly firmly established. You know, our books will be all on much longer than we will be. And uh, yeah. the people that we've taught will carry on mm -hmm. what they've learned for a long time. Yeah. For gener That's true. Yeah. But the other question that you raise, am I enough? I got an answer for you, which is not an answer, but a question. Who's asking? It's good. Who's actually asking? Like, I think the part of us that still asks, am I enough, is still a traumatized part. Because because, because by, um, would you say to anybody else, are you enough? You know, we, we would probably say, you are enough because you're a human being, because you exist, not because you've done this or done that or achieve this or achieve that, but just because you are. Mm -hmm. Now, that may be kind of a intellectualized spiritual answer, but I really think that the very question of am I enough, it's more important to examine where that question even comes from yeah. than to come up with an answer for it. Right. But to me, it's a work in progress. Exactly. And I'm hoping that I'll always be asking that question. And right. the autobiography ends with me as an 18-month-old as a picture. Yeah. And reconnecting to that precious dear child who has gone through all of that horrific trauma and come back to him, yeah. back to myself. Yeah. Thank you both. Yeah, Gabbard, did you also want some uh, time to share a bit of your timeline? My timeline? Yeah, about how you got started. For your development. My timeline about what? Sorry. Just how we met. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> uh, your timeline of how you entered into work the field you know, in your work of trauma. Yeah, well, look, um, <clears throat> I suppose, um, I don't suppose. Um, so I was in family practice and I was delivering babies and working with dying people. And uh, I was also working in palliative care, working with dying people. I mentioned that last night. Um, and after a while, I couldn't help but notice that disease or what we call disease. By the way, let me just take a, a, a detour here for a minute. This whole idea of disease itself or illness, physical or mental. When you say, I have multiple sclerosis or I have depression, or I have ADHD, or I have cancer. There's an assumption there. What's the assumption? The assumption is there's this thing, there's an entity called cancer. There's an entity called multiple sclerosis. There's an entity called um, ADHD. There's an entity called depression. And then there's me. And I have that entity. Mm. It's not how it is. I have a cell phone. I can put it down, pick it up, throw it, catch it, put it in my pocket. It's no part of me. It doesn't manifest anything about me. But multiple sclerosis, cancer, ADHD, depression, these are not things in themselves. 
There are processes that happen inside an organism. And that organism has a history. And that history was lived in a certain context, in a multi-generational context, in a cultural context, in a communal context. And that process reflects all that. So it's not a separate entity in itself. So even to say that I have a disease, um, I, I mean, it certainly refers to something real, but it there's an assumption there that there's the me, then there's the disease. The two are not separate. That process manifests something about my life. And so I began to notice all these things that they never talk to you about in medical school. And, um, and so I realized when somebody comes with rheumatoid arthritis, it's fine. I can give them the anti-inflammatories or the immune suppressants or the steroids. Um, but have I dealt with the underlying process? Or am I just addressing the manifestations and the symptoms, which is what mostly what medicine does? That can be helpful and necessary, but is it enough? So I said, well, I, I got to start talking to people, listen to them. And um, where I was in family practice, my clients couldn't afford private psychologists. And when it comes to psychiatrists, I found there were two kinds, those that were good and those that were available. Um, those that were available were not good, and those that were good were not available. They were too busy. So uh, by, I, I'm slandering a whole profession here, but I'm expressing my, my experience with the limitations of modern psychiatry. So I had to begin to start counseling people myself. So that's when I began to get into deep into people's lives. At the same time, I had to come to terms with my own depression, my own difficulties concentrating, my related, the troubles in my marriage, the fact that my kids were sometimes afraid of me, um, all the difficulties. So I had to start dealing with my own stuff. Um, and then I began to realize that uh, all these things I've been noticing about people's traumatic experiences and the manifestations and in terms of mental, physical health, lo and behold, I wasn't the first one to notice things. That is people like Peter who has been talking about them for decades by the time I came to these understandings. And so I began to look at the research. So the trajectory, if you will, was a combination mm -hmm. of my clinical observations and experience with my patients. Um, number one, number two, having to deal with my own stuff big time. Uh, and then discovering of the very rich literature, research, and uh, really pioneering thinking that had been published, but which nobody tells you about in medical school. Mm -hmm. And it was in that process that I discovered Peter's work and those of Bessel and other people as well. Um, never for a minute in those days did I think I'd be sitting on stage with Peter at some point. You know, or, uh, um, so it's been for me a process of professional learning, looking at the research, and then doing my own stuff. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. You know, your most recent book, The Myth of Normal, Yeah, I thought of a, a good uh, subtitle for that. Yeah. When uh, Society Becomes the Addict. Yeah. Well, there's been a book with that title, you know. Oh, was there? Oh, I get too late. <laughs> did, did you know that there's a book called When Society? No. Yeah, the book is called When Society is the Addict, or Society Becomes an Addict. That's the exact title of the book. Interesting. Yeah, and it was written in the 1980s, I think. Yeah. Um, but Peter, it, speaking of the myth of normal, I mean, Peter is the first person I quote in that book um, mm -hmm. uh, on, on a chapter on trauma and, and the, uh, the, the the essential insight mm -hmm. Um that that trauma is not what actually happened to you, but trauma is what happens inside you as a result of what happens to you. That's Peter's. I don't know anybody else that has formulated it that way before, but that, and people still don't get it. A lot of people still think trauma is what happened to you. Yes. Um, and trauma is not the sexual abuse. The sexual abuse is traumatic, but the trauma is the belief that you deserved it. The trauma is the belief sure. that you had deserved nothing better. The trauma is that something wrong with you, that you should be ashamed of your body, or that you're only valued or valuable if you act out sexually. That's the wound. 
So th that insight is Peter's, and I think it's key to anybody that works with trauma. And I, I mentioned it now because I forgot to mention it last night. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes um, uh, somebody sends a book yeah. uh, you know, to endorse it or just to, to yeah. mention it. Yeah. And I noticed the quote there. I was summing through one of them. I noticed the quote and I thought, my God, I really, I can totally relate to that. Yeah. And, and then I realized she was quoting uh, me from an unspoken voice. <laughs> and and um, uh, uh, what what I what I wrote then was trauma is not so much what happens to us yeah. the event, yeah, but it's rather what we hold inside exactly in the absence of that present empathetic connected other. That's right. That's yeah. right. Which you know. Like your experience of no, I'm sorry, that patient's experience of being held down and getting the tonsillectomy. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking when you mentioned that, yeah. But what happened afterwards? Did somebody hold her? Did somebody help her process yeah. that experience? You know, and yeah. uh, in your book, Trauma Proofing Your Kids, mm -hmm. you, you you talk about these medical traumas. Yeah, yeah. But the trauma really comes from not just the painful, and again, it's a distinction that Peter makes. Is that um, uh, uh, that not everything that's painful and stressful is traumatic? It becomes traumatic in the absence of holding, in the yeah. absence of understanding, in the absence of being seen, and so that people have pain and stress without being traumatized. Everything I think what you said is that everything traumatic is painful and stressful, but not everything painful and stressful is actually traumatic. Yeah. And what's missing is precisely that. And that's where this, this society fails. Yeah. We just fail to hold each other. Yeah. We fail to hold communities. And we fail to hold children in yeah. their pain. Now, the Buddhists are quite right. Life brings pain. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't need to be traumatic. Yeah. The trauma is in the absence of that support, that being held. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to be calm. And to be calm. If you guys are going to applaud every time Peter or I say something smart, you'll be a, you'll be wasting so much time <laughs> applauding. So just forget it. Silent claps. <laughs> Silent yeah. claps. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, going with this theme, what for each of you is a legacy of trauma? Because this, the whole theme of, of this panel is on legacy. I want to go into what is a legacy of trauma? How does it show up in ourselves or in the world? Um, when you mean legacy of trauma, you mean the impact of trauma? The way it's, could, will legacy being the way things are passed on oh, or okay. passed forward or created yeah. from? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Is it? I think we kind of just covered that. Um, I mean... There was a study now, some time ago. Uh, in, I think it was, I think it was in Israel because a lot of trauma comes into the emergency room. So they were giving them a drug to dampen their blood pressure and heart rate. And I wrote to the researchers and said, I have an idea for a control to have somebody there available mm. to just take your arm. And just to say, I'm here, mm. I'm here with you. Mm. And I think that the myth of normal is really what's lacking in our society today, yeah. Yeah. is to really get to the core of what is important. Yeah. And I think yeah. your book, recent book, did a great job on that. Yeah. I mean, you look at how human beings evolved. Um, um, actually, Many of you might know the book, The uh, Continuum Concept by Jean Lidlop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she was a, I think she's a model or somebody, but she went to live in this Amazonian tribe in Brazil somewhere. Okay. And she looked at just how Aboriginal peoples, indigenous people, hunter-gatherer groups lived. And uh, she makes the point in her book, and I, I quote her, um, that our lungs 
don't expect oxygen consciously. They're an expectancy for oxygen. Our lungs evolved in an oxygen-filled environment. Mm -hmm. If there was no oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere, there'd be no creatures with lungs to process oxygen. So it's not that the lungs expect oxygen, they're an expectancy, they evolved in expectancy. In the same way, human beings evolved as an expectancy. There's a great book by Darcy Narvaez, uh, who's a retired psychologist at Notre Dame called The Evolved Nest. And she talks about how, and she makes this point in her work that we evolved being expected to be held. Mm -hmm. Like any mammalian infant expects mm -hmm. to be held. Not expects, is an expectation to be held. They don't, if they're not held, they suffer. So human beings evolved as an expectation for communality, for collaboration, for being held, for being protected, mm -hmm. for being nurtured, for being part of a community yeah. of multi-generational beings. That's our expectancy. Yeah. That's how we evolved. Now we can function in other situations, but how well do we function in other situations? And if you look at this society, and I talked about this last night, about the ethic is that we're individualistic and aggressive and selfish and manipulative and greedy. If that's our basic belief about ourselves, what about the evolutionary expectancy for collaboration, communality, yeah. being held, belonging, being understood? Yeah. Yeah. So that we live in a culture that just doesn't hold us. Yeah. And no, no, no wonder then that there's so many dysfunction, yeah. so much dysfunction. Yeah. I don't know where that came from. I, yeah. What, what, what question was I answering? Yeah. Was it <laughs> All of them. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, in that regard, I mean, you know, when we think about the the evolution and trauma healing, yeah, and I think that for some time it was very individualistic. Yeah, it was it was about the individual, and that is imperative. Yeah, and it and missed the rings of trauma, the ripples mm -hmm. of trauma, how they created politic, the pol political stances were, yeah, in, or the the governmental choices that are being made, yeah. or fights within communities or groups or this is, and so I think that's part of what I'd love to, because each of you talk about that and have seen that evolution in the work of trauma as yeah. well. I mean, I think the thing that we're living here in this epoch of time is that um, to be able to transition from brute force as being the thing that societies need to do rather than cooperation. And I think if people have asked, am I uh, pessimistic or uh, optimistic? And I say a little bit of both, because I think this really is one of the uh, gifts that we have in this time is to really make a society that works, that functions. And uh, yeah, and I, I, I think, again, that's why we're all here, really, quite frankly, is to, is cooperation. Uh, the, the, just the previous lecture, what, what was his name again? Albert. Albert, oh, that's right, yeah, yeah. And uh, he, um, he really talked about the intricacies of the individual and of the society. I had the privilege once of uh, being invited to come to a, a, a tribe in a pretty remote area in Brazil called the Kranaki people. And I wanted to know uh, how they understood sustus, sustus, which in Portuguese means fright paralysis, which is basically trauma. And so we had been walking like at a hundred degrees in the noonday sun. And we finally got there dripping in sweat. And actually we bought as a gift from the market, a big a big fish. And we were carrying that with us and it was starting to smell, but we kept going. And then when we finally got there, he could see that we were really in need of a change in uh, situation. 
So they put just a few weeks ago, they found a spring and they put a pipe in it. And so you could go under it and actually have a shower. So he mm. took me there and said, you need to cool down. And then after he asked me, well, why did you come? And I said, well, I wanted to know if you understood Shustus, how you understood Shustus. And he said also he knew the word trauma because his daughter, the princess, uh, she was the first one to go to school and she knew about it and told him about it. And so then he invited me to come out and with a bamboo mat, we sat underneath a mango tree and he started playing the flute. And I asked if I could join. And he basically said, that's what they're here for. So we played along for a while. And then he said, you know, that trauma, it doesn't happen to the individual. Hmm. It happens to all of us, to the hmm. society, because they were um, basically thrown off their land by the by the uh, farmers and so forth. Hmm. They finally found their way back to that land. And they were trying to put all of the pieces together in this ecological way. And there was this one woman uh, she had a high pregnancy, high uh, uh, pregnancy risk, high risk pregnancy, and uh, she, so she was taken to the hospital, which was about four hours from there, three and a half, four hours, and uh, the 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 babies were stillborn. They died, both of them died, and she was in tremendous shock and depression, and they wanted to give her shock treatment. So in the middle of the night, a group came with a ladder and they put it up to her window and brought her back and then took her back to the tribe. And they do this with drumming, drumming and moving. It's really pretty amazing. Uh, when we did that, we could really feel a change in our state of consciousness. And she was just left to be there on the outside. And then morning after morning, evening after evening, finally, some of the people in the tribe started to cry. And then she started to cry. Mm. And then she joined the group. And so I got what he meant, what he was talking about. It's not about what happens to us, but what happens to everybody and everything around us, where we're embedded in around us. Thank you. Too. Thank you. Gabor, do you want to address that? You just kind of wrote a whole book on it as well. Say it again. I said, do you want to take that question as well as you just wrote a whole book on it around the navigation of the evolution of from the individualistic uh, approach to trauma to the yeah. more yeah. recognizing. Well, look, the... The Buddha said 2,600 years ago, um, he talked about the interdependent co-arising of phenomena. Mm -hmm. And he said, and he said, contemplate all the time, the interdependent co-arising. Nothing arises on itself, individually, mm -hmm. on its own. He says, think of a leaf or a raindrop. That leaf contains the whole world. Contains the sky, the irrigation, the, the rain. It contains the sunlight, the photosynthesis. It contains the earth, the minerals, maybe the activity of animals or human beings. So that leaf contains the whole world. In that sense, everything contains the whole world. And um, our understanding, which is based again, like you have to understand something. Um, The movie The Matrix, the reason it's so powerful and so influential, because we all in the matrix, we think that something is reality, but it isn't. Our view of reality is very much shaped by the culture that we live in. So that when Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist teacher who died two years ago now, he talked about, he says, it's not that we are, he says, we enter our we enter our interbeing, the interdependent core rising of phenomena. Buddha said, 
this arises because that arises, this dies because that dies. Yeah. And the experience that Peter just described. Now, the frustrating thing is that these ancient insights and these indigenous traditional wisdoms have now been completely and thoroughly validated by Western science. And there's such a huge gap between traditional wisdom and modern science on the one hand and how the society functions. So we're not only cut off from traditional human wisdom, we don't even regard the findings of our own science. So politicians and legal personnel and teachers and let alone doctors, a lot of psychologists, they're not even aware. So we're trained ideologically, we're programmed in this matrix, in this capitalist matrix, we're programmed to see things in individual basis and not to see the interconnections. I don't need to repeat what I said about that last night, but it just, you know, if you look at the um, chromosomes of people of color in this country, they're more aged than those of Caucasians. Nothing to do with genetics. It has to do with experience in a certain culture. Yeah. And uh, it's almost, and I've had people tell me this, scientists tell me this, that they look, they can look at certain aspects of the chromosomal functioning of a person and tell you what neighborhood they came from. But the resistance to that is immense because yeah. if that truth of the interbeing of our nature was recognized, this society would have to fundamentally change. And that would threaten certain power structures and certain forms of control and, and profit and, 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 and domination. Mm -hmm. So it's not just an ideological mistake. It's also a political exigency that we don't look at reality except through the matrix, which keeps us individualistic and cut off. And th that's why the trauma work is on the one hand, I mean, look, 20 years ago, you wouldn't have had all these people show up for a trauma conference. You wouldn't have had. And part of the reason you have it today is because the crisis has become so clear and, and particularly the sensitive ones are so acutely aware of it. So on the one hand, thanks to the work of Peter and other pioneers, we've had this exuberant interest in things to do with trauma. But on the other hand, there's tremendous resistance to it. The average medical student still doesn't get a single lecture on trauma. Unbelievable, but they don't. So the resistance is also enormous. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why I see the... the so, no, 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 I haven't even... I'm not going to go into it now. I'll, I'll spare you the lecture on politics. But, uh, but our politics reflects trauma. If, if they reflect anything, they reflect trauma dynamics. Yeah. The people at the top are deeply traumatized, wounded individuals who refuse to look at their own woundedness. Yes. And uh, as a result, they inflict wounds on everybody else. That's what happens. You got claps anyway. Yeah. yeah. I think it's I think it's also daunting for a lot of people when we go from the individual model, like if, if Peter was to work with one of us, yeah. it's it's accessible. I mean, yeah. now it yeah. is maybe 20, 30 years ago it wasn't. Yeah. And then when we start to recognize, oh, the, the chicken and the egg trauma phenomenon, which is that the, uh, you know, what's affecting what, and both are affecting what, both. And so the daunting nature of going, oh my God, these systems, these environments that are holding us are actually perpetuating or increasing the individual trauma and the individual trauma feeds into that ecosystem. Oh my gosh, where do we begin? Where do we begin? Yeah. That's the dilemma, and um, I don't. 
Yeah. That's the dilemma. Is how, do, how do we translate this awareness into some kind of meaningful social action? I don't know how to answer that question. I I, I, I do what I do. Um, we all have our platforms. We have our capabilities. We do what we can. But fundamentally, I, I, here's how I see it. And I quote this all the time. There's a Jewish rabbi. I think his name was Hillel. He lived uh, 100 years before Jesus. Um and he was talking about this is Jewish concept called Tikkun Olam, which means healing the world. And he said, the task is not yours to finish, but neither are you free not to take part in it. So I think we just have to contribute what we can and not be attached to the outcome, not get frustrated because things don't move as fast as we can and we want them to. Mm -hmm. History is beyond any individual, but we can all make a contribution. So I think the question is, yeah. what can my contribution to be? Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's the meaning of Tekom Alam, yeah. to leave the world in a better place than we found it. Yeah. And not to judge if it's big enough. Yeah. But it's the right thing. Absolutely. Yeah. I really appreciate that you both went there. I think that there's some conception, especially when we get flooded and daunted by the nature of, of the the bigness of trauma mm -hmm. as systems. Yeah, that we might feel like there is a way in, and we might expect that from other people as well. And there's multitude. There's so many ways in, as long as we're moving in. Yeah. yeah. Well, that doesn't really require a response. I think I just agree with you. That's all. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the head nods. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so with that, uh, I want to take some time to have people ask some questions too. So I'm going to to wrap up with one last question. And, and this is a continuation of what we were just talking about, is that as you both have written and taught and advanced the field of trauma healing, what is the legacy you wish to leave behind? What is the wish? Yeah. What is the legacy that you wish to leave behind? Hmm. Um, you know, when I first started teaching what became somatic experiencing in the early 1970s, um, you know, and there was an audience I was talking to and a lot of people, well, a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists just left the room and they said this is dangerous mm. to actually do something with the body <laughs> and it i mean and really there was that happened more than once more than many times and uh, i think the question is or the answer really is that what was once fringe when I started presenting it, this yeah. was considered fringe, it was considered yeah. dangerous. Yeah. Um, it's no longer that way. It's now in the collective, you know? Um, I, I don't know. One of the Lifetime Achievement Awards I got was from the Psychotherapy Networker. Yeah. And in the magazine for that month when I, they presented it was, you know, one of those thousand piece puzzles that you put together mm. well there was a a, a picture of a of a person with all of those uh pieces except one was missing and the the one that was missing was the body not just the anatomical body but the living knowing alive body mm. is what we're talking about and that really i think that story is now unfolded and it becomes topics of a group like this of you know several hundred people yeah yeah so i think the the tide has turned and um yeah yeah and if to if, to have gone through that those whole several decades um i can tell you that as an observer that things have changed, that things continue to change, and that one of the things I really like about this program, first of all, it's great because you don't have to find what room you want to go to a workshop because it's all in one room. I think that's great. Um, but um, 
but really, um, uh, yeah, times they are a changing. Yeah. Um, so I'm trained as a medical doctor and uh, I worked that way for 32 years. And uh, uh, <laughs> I live in British Columbia, Canada. And um, finally, the doctors are beginning to discover me. You know, at age 80, I've become a promising young man. You know, <laughs> so a month ago, they asked me to get a webinar to a couple of thousand doctors online. That was a big thing. I've only been talking about this for 25 years. Now, yeah. You know, and there's a new medical school going up in possibly in Vancouver, uh, in addition to the other one. And the organizers there asked me to potentially have some input. Um, but that's a shift. That would not have yeah. happened 10, 15, 20 years. No, no, no. Um, but I have to say that on the whole, um, within the medical world at least, this is very slow stuff. Um, let me tell you a story that that I quote in the myth of normal. But I, in 1938, 39, there was a very famous Hungarian Jewish yeah, doctor at Harvard. His name was Soma Weiss. And he came from Transylvania. And he was so honored, um, so revered, that to this day at Harvard, every year they have a day in his honor. Oh. It's called the Soma Weiss Research Day. Mm. Cool. In 39, he gave a very famous lecture uh, to a medical school class in which he said that emotional and psychological factors are as important in the causation of illness as physiological factors, yeah. and they must be at least as important in the, in the healing of it, in the treatment. Yeah. This, uh, this lecture was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1940. Hmm. Four years ago, talking to a friend of mine, a psychiatrist at Harvard, he said that to this day to talk about mind-body medicine at Harvard is to jeopardize your career. So on the one hand, they revere Weiss for his physiological accomplishments, and they've completely forgotten what he said about the unity and the oneness of everything. Yeah. So now that's slowly beginning to change. Yeah. And yeah. I know I've made some contribution to that, but it's it's still baby steps as far as I'm concerned. And mm -hmm. I mean, let me just ask you to finish that. This is a party trick that I pull at all my talks. So if in the last five or 10 years, you've been to a gastroenterologist, uh, neurologist, immunologist, cardiologist, gas, you know, um, respirologist, um, any kind of an ologist, just raise your hand, would you? Very good, thank you. And raise your hand if they asked you about trauma in your childhood. One or two people. Raise your, hand, raise your hand if they ask you about how you feel about yourself as a human being. Yeah. Raise your hand if they ask you about people. how what your relationship is like with your significant other. Very few hands. How do you feel about your work? Did they ask you about that? These questions they didn't ask you had everything to do while you were there in the first place. In most cases. So that's how behind we are. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, there was another um, medical doctor around that time, a little bit later, named Hans Salye, also a yeah, Hungarian. Yeah. Another Hungarian. Another Hungarian. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he saved my life because they were not going to let me have my thesis well, accepted. Yeah. Right. And he wrote a letter yeah. saying how important my work was. Yeah. He really saved my well, behind. Right. Anyhow, what he noticed, he would go to the lectures and the, the doctors would present one case after another. And then they would talk about this disease and that disease and so yeah. forth. And Salye realized that actually the thing is that they all just looked sick. Yeah. yeah. Not just that they had a disease, but they did not look well. Yeah. And also... Um, I I had a meeting with Vincent Filetti once we were gonna, we were filming uh, yeah yeah and who lives he, here in San Diego by the way yes yes yeah. yes yes yeah 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 and uh, amazing person and he developed the ACE questionnaire ACEs questionnaire 
which is adverse childhood experiences. Uh, I mentioned that last night. Not everybody was here last night, oh. but I talked about Vince and, and the oh, okay. studies. Yeah. But anyhow, yeah. when we were being filmed, you know, we were kind of, each one of us was being filmed and then the three or four of us together was filmed. And I asked them, and I asked them you know, and again, this was at that time, that almost nobody really took his work seriously. And I asked him, do you sometimes really feel sad about that? And he looked at me philosophically and said, well, you know, medicine tends to be conservative. Yeah. <laughs> and it has its pluses and it has its minuses. But he said something like, again, but I'm not holding on to this. I've just made the scale and it's now used in many, many places, yeah. many school districts and yeah. so forth. So yeah, it didn't happen all at once. It took time, but then many, many people are aware of asking the right questions that, as you just said, yeah. 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 So yeah. thank you. And, and then when I say thank you, I mean, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Your thank work. You. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think all of us here, including myself, don't have didn't have to go through the fight that both of you did. And I know the personal stories from from both of your experiences of what it was like to say that the body existed, that it held trauma, yeah. that addiction is not just something that's biological alone. Yeah. And those fights are real. And I want to yeah. honor that part of the legacy that you leave behind is that we don't have to fight so hard. Yeah. That we get to meet. Yeah. Uh, we get you, one you step. Do, you do have to fight. So we got it with somebody. Yeah, 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 yeah. As hard, I said. <laughs> we don't have to fight as hard. And and we get one step closer to just meeting the humans that need the support without the prayer. And so thank you. Thank you. I want to take some. Oh, the already lines. All right. <laughs> so what I'm going to ask uh, for the next uh, 20 some minutes with questions is that we we keep to questions I'm going to ask that you keep the stories and the narratives inside for now and just stick to the questions. Okay, my loves. Thank you. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? I can. What's your name? My name is Cindy. Hi, Cindy. I live in Chicago. A little louder, love. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I have been uh, in analysis and analytically trained for the past 30 years, terminating my 25 year analysis in two weeks. And I have really struggled with the intellectual, uh, you know, analysis is really good and you learn a foundation, but it really does not talk about, and it, you know, the self-disclosure and the dynamic and what's going on mm -hmm. and the feelings. And I think that's what's drawn me to this. So I just would love to hear your thoughts about, if you know what, about analysis, about psychoanalytic thought, about somatic training and healing. Thank you. So the, the question was about um, psychoanalysis. Right. And its relation to what you want to share about it in relationship to perhaps somatics. Yeah. You know, I actually, I think I have something to say about about that, um, that one of the the somatic experiencing is the uh, the methodology that I the approach that I developed over the past fifty years plus or minus, and um, one of the things that makes it particularly useful and powerful is that it's not a therapy per se, but it's rather an approach that makes anybody that can be used by many disciplines to make their those disciplines more powerful. So again, it's not what what they do so much as how they do what they do, and that applies to psychoanalysis and mm -hmm. and all of the other uh, different psychotherapies and developmental workings. Yeah. Yeah. Um... The reason I'm standing, by the way, so I can hear the monitor because yeah. my hearing is not so good. Um, uh, 
I never got the whole idea of you lie on a, you know, the, the classical Viennese suck guy, you know, suck on, you, know, you lie on this couch, this guy with a beard is sitting there taking notes. You're not even looking at each other. Your body experience is not even explored and you just riff uh, from the, you know, okay. and then you get analyzed and you do this an hour and a half, five days a week for 20 years. <laughs> I mean, come on. The, the, the thing with Freud is he, um, he had wonderful just insight. Just don't be negative about it. I mean, it's not only negative. Oh. There would, is would you mind letting me oh, finish? Hold, hold on, yeah, please. I just want to say. Thank you. That's fine. I mean, I'm happy to have you here what you say. I just want to finish yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. Or did I just trigger you? Yeah. Yeah, you uh, triggered me. Thank okay, you. well then take care of it. Yeah. 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 No, what I was going to say was this. Yeah. Freud, when he began his work, he understood trauma. He realized that a lot of the women coming to me in middle class, respectable Viennese society, um, were sexually abused. And he wrote about it. And at some point, two things happened. He realized that um, in polite Viennese society, you're not going to make a career exposing sexual abuse. Number one, number two, he ignored his own stuff. So he came up with, you know, for all these great contributions about the unconscious, about the importance of early childhood experience. I mean, he was a real pioneer, but he was blind. And so he denied trauma. And then instead of recognizing that these women had been sexually abused, he, he said that they had a fantasy of sleeping with their fathers. So he blamed it on the client. Yeah. And then that was psychoanalysis for decades based on the denial of trauma. So it, it began as a um, powerful breakthrough at the source of what was called neurosis in those days, then became a font for all these cockamamie theories about Electro complex and Oedipus complex and penis envy and all this kind of stuff, you know. So, for all his great contributions, he also led people down the wrong path in significant ways. Now, what did you want to say to me? What do I want to say? Yeah, I want to say that uh, I think that you're doing a disservice. I think that it's very negative. I think that there's well, a lot of... Uh, don't tell me what I'm doing. Tell me where I'm wrong, okay? Don't um, call me names. Tell me yeah. what I'm saying that's incorrect. I think that having... Uh, I think that analysis is about finding a way to go inside of yourself. The couch is about uh, blocking that visual so that you can go inside deeper. You okay. know, everybody's different in terms of how they are well, animalists. If right? that was, first of all, you might want to think about what, why you got so upset, because I was only expressing an opinion. And when people get triggered, I may have mentioned this last night, but when you think of a trigger, and you said you were triggered, a trigger is a small little thing. The reason a trigger works is because it's explosive material inside somebody. You might want to look at what is your explosive material here. What's the charge that got blown off here? Sure. Number one, did I threaten something about your experience? Number one. Number two, if psychoanalysis works for you, I'm very happy for you. But I'm talking about processes which are Peter, when Peter works with people on stage, you know, on, on, in, in, in his clinic or in, as a demonstration on stage, he's engaged with them, he's looking at them, he is aware of every single body movement. He's aware of how fast their pulse is beating in their necks. He's observant of how their body moves or gets stiff. Their breathing patterns. And it's interactive, it's human, it's attuned. When I work with people, it's the same thing. I don't do his method, I do what I do. But I've learned a lot from his method. But it's interactive, it's relational. We got wounded in relationship. We're going to heal in relationship. If I was lying here on the couch and Peter was taking notes and I was yakking about myself, there's no relationship. There's no interactivity. There's no awareness of the body. I'm saying it's a deficient method. Now, as Peter also said just now, 
that it's not just a question of what you're doing, it's a question of how you're doing it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if that psychoanalyst makes you feel at home and welcomed mm -hmm. and understood and received, well, it's gonna work. Yeah. But I but but, but I but I think <laughs> it's missing certain elements <laughs> that are far more efficient. <laughs> Take an easy more, breath. Um, time effective. That's what I think. Um, yeah. You know, it's kind of interesting. Just thinking about the evolution. Because we went from the couch, Freud, to the chair with our client, to the next evolution, which is standing and moving Yeah, with the client. So, I invite you all to get up. And just move that body. Oh, yeah. Gain out, though. Yeah. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> Whoa. Make rattling roll. Good, 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 good. Okay. All right. <laughs> oh, we need bouncy balls in here, y'all. <laughs> oh, actually, in your bag is a ball. You can blow up and sit on it. And oh, I'll see. I put those in there. Yeah, thank you. That was really smart. Get a bouncy ball. Uh, yeah. All right, I'm going to take the next person over here. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So uh, I've gotten so much. I'm full of gratitude, and I'm getting immersed in this language. And I uh, pretty much usually give back by attending 12-step programs. And so since we're talking about your legacy, um, it doesn't seem like that kind of goes together. So my question is, how do you see someone like me honoring your legacies by contributing and connecting with community and bringing it back after all of this that we're absorbing yeah. this week? Well, when it comes to, are you talking about addiction specifically? I would say trauma, which I think addiction is, the root cause is trauma. Because 12 steps are typically designed for people with addictions, right? Yeah. Right, because there's also ACA and there's yeah, yeah, CODA. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, well, look, I think the 12 steps are wonderful. I think anybody in the world, addicted or not, would benefit from recognizing that there's more to you. There's a higher power than just the little ego, an ego itself. You know, you don't have to call it God. You can call it nature. You can call it conscience, whatever you want. We could benefit from recognizing that we have patterns that we've been powerless over that are running our lives. That's a really great insight. We would benefit from recognizing that we've done things to hurt others and maybe didn't mean to what we did and to take responsibility for that and to own that. Those steps are all wonderful. What's missing from the 12-step movement for me is a very rigid and seems to be almost universal, maybe not totally rigid, maybe not so universal anymore, but traditional resistance to recognizing trauma. So I don't understand, not that I don't understand. I think that the 12 steps would be greatly enhanced by a yeah. fuller understanding of trauma, that addiction is not this disease that's taken you over, but it was your attempt to escape from pain and that pain. And what's interesting is that Dr. D Dr. W, the person who founded AA, was a traumatized child. His parents abandoned him when he was 12 years old. And so that there's this curious resistance to dealing with trauma in the 12-step movement overall. That's what I think is missing. I'd love to see the 12 steps combined with some trauma awareness. That's yeah. what I would say. But I, I think that's happening. Yeah, that's what... I think it's happening. I mean, I consult for an organization, the Meadows. Yeah. And they really, um, of course, I mean, I think the 12 steps has tremendous amount of wisdom. Yeah. Really tre tremendously wise. But by itself, uh, I think it's limited, of course. I mean, but again, if you bring together some of the knowledge of, of trauma and abuse and so forth, then it becomes even more effective and more useful to us but sometimes i just i'm blown away when i look at the uh you know when i when i look at some of those steps i think they're really very very wise yeah and so how would i bring that back well that depends on how much receptivity you have 
just by connecting mm -hmm. and listening. I mean, you can state your case. And, yes. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Huh. You know what Yogi Berra, the great uh, baseball player and manager, once said? He said that if the people don't want to go to the ball game, there's nothing you can do to stop them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so either they're receptive or yeah. they so where else could I go besides 12 steps? I, I'm going to recommend we take one question, though, because yeah, we have yeah. so many great yeah. Yeah, questions yeah, in line. So if you can keep the questions to one or two sentences, keep the narrative inside, we can get to more people. And I want to get that opportunity to as many people. Good. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Hi, Scott. Hi, Melissa. <laughs> nice to see Hi, you. Guys. Is this a question from online? I do. I have some Love online. It. I have lots of online questions. I'm going to cool. do one now. And if we have time at the end, I'll do another. This answers, this is two questions, two different people, Madison and Emma, are both wondering when trying to explain a mental health diagnosis, what narrative should they use? Uh, should it be uh, different? Do you have any examples? How would you reframe, you know, depression, ADHD, MS, so uh -huh. people understand you, but also without that, you know, what you're talking about? Well, um, first of all, um, I would get rid of the idea of the illness and talk about the process. Um, I would talk about illness. I, I would, I, I mentioned this before, I don't need to go over it again, but I would get rid of the idea of the illness as a separate um, concrete entity that is taking you over. I would look at what's the process happening in your mind and body. Secondly, what's the interbeing aspect of it? What are the sources? And I find that virtually not in every mental illness or what's so-called mental illness there is whether people recognize it or not a history of trauma number one and number two the mental illness so-called became or started off as a coping mechanism or as a response to that trauma and in working through that trauma we can change the process so rather than framing it in terms of the diseases Let's talk about processes as a result of life experience. And then let's, in the therapeutic um, encounter, create new experiences to change that process. And I would apply the same thing, whether it's um, ADHD or depression or bipolar conditions or anxiety or even psychosis. Yeah, yeah Boris, is there a sentence you might use? Let's say you have a a new employer or a new loved one partner is there a sentence you might use to kind of describe what you're going through without that without you know labeling yourself in that way i don't understand the question sorry i i hear the words but i don't understand. Was, explain the question again well, i think rather than go from what's wrong with you yeah to what happened to you yeah i think that's where we need well, to that... and what's happening and what's happening and, yeah. and what's currently happening yeah. to you yes Sound good? All right. Hi. Hi. Can you say your you. name, love? Thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. My name is Sheila Cash, Sheila. and I practice neuropsychology for about 20, 22 years now. And you've informed my work greatly as I work in clinics and in schools and in families and their homes. I am wondering um, if you can expand my thinking on autism spectrum disorder through the lens of everything we've talked about, ACEs and trauma-informed and mind-body connection, autoimmune, and co-regulation, and all of it. Please help me. I've thought about this for years and years, and I'd love to have some more informed uh, thinking on it. Okay, so autism, um, for one reason or another, the diagnosis has been burgeoning, hasn't it, over the last several decades? So that could be a number of reasons for that. One is there could be more people with the condition if there's such a condition. Yeah. Number two, we might be better at recognizing it. Number three, we might be overzealously recognizing it and diagnosing it. Number four, because of funding considerations, if you can diagnose somebody, they can get support and funding. And maybe that's what's driving, you know. So there's all these factors. Yeah. But probably, and they probably all contribute, but probably there's also more kids mm -hmm. who are manifesting behaviors and mm -hmm. dynamics that yeah. could be understood yeah. under the yeah. autism spectrum umbrella yeah. Yeah. why is that and so mm -hmm. if we think of genetics there's no possible explanation because genes don't change over a population in 10 15 20 50 or 100 years so we got to look yeah. at some social factors that are going on i think 
And there's some research, but it's very rudimentary, that what actually is happening is that the brains of kids are being affected in utero by stress, yeah. social stresses on mothers. Yeah. Uh, it's not the mother's fault. The mothers are doing their best. They love their kids. But we now know yeah. that the brain develops an interaction with the environment. Um, the process begins before birth. To quote this article from Harvard that I read to you last night, that the process of brain development becomes before birth. And stresses on the pregnant woman, uh, which uh, uh, evoke the release of stress hormones, amongst other things, to the placenta to the baby, right. affect the child's baby's brain development. And these kids are not as responsive mm -hmm. and not as um, emotionally reactive or as engaged as as, as non autistic babies are. That has an impact on the parents. So they get anxious and you get this recursive reinforcement of difficulty in emotional engagement and vulnerability, which is what characterizes autism. And I think it's a social phenomenon based on stress on women not their fault. That's how I see it. That then affects the child's brain. That's how I understand it. You know, and there's some evidence that the more stressed women are, the more likely that they have autistic kids. If they have physical illness during pregnancy, that seems to have an impact on the rate of autism. So I do think these are probably prenatal uh, influences for the most part. You know, um, I think they have a couple minutes here. Um, is um, how do we engage with people who are on the spectrum? By the way, there's a wonderful, wonderful thing on Netflix called Love on the Spectrum, the Australian version, the Australian version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 no, it's really nice. Anyhow, uh, some years ago, uh, uh, I was asked to see this young man who was clearly uh, on the autistic spectrum and he worked in, uh, of course, uh, 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 technology, and but he didn't live really near me. So uh, he would come down and we do about meet four sessions or so, and then he would come back the next year. And so when he first came, he came with his computer and he asked me to open my computer and he would send me an email, then I would respond. So in other words, I was meeting him where he was, yeah. not trying to change him or diagnose him, but just to meet him. And then the, basically the same thing happened the next year. But then on the third year, something happened. He had his computer and he didn't open it. Mm -hmm. And we started to talk. And then the year after that, he met this woman and they uh, uh, became a, together. And uh, right, and every year, I get this wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, photographs or come from him of he and his wife at their four-year-old child, wow. and they are so connected mm -hmm. and so non-autistic. Mm -hmm. But again, please don't understand. This doesn't work with everybody, but it's true that we really do have to meet our clients where they are right. and not where we think they should be. And see it as a process rather than a condition. And a process, of yeah. course. You might want to check out, if you haven't already, the work of Dr. Stanley Greenspan. Greenspan is a child psychiatrist. He used to be the head of the National Institutes of Health right. Child Psychiatry Branch. He worked with autistic kids. He said he could bring them to a higher level of functioning than other kids by giving them the right kind of relationship. So, um, yeah. Stanley Greenspan, just check out his yeah. work. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's take a pause. We're, I think we're at the time, my love. Can I do one more? <laughs> uh, can, you make it, can, can you make it really quick? Sure. Okay. I'm a music therapist. Yeah. And um, as okay. someone practicing an alternative therapy, I'm hoping to bridge somatic therapy with music mm -hmm. therapy. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas for that, since they're both alternative therapies. Right. Yeah, I mean, there is a book by a music therapist who uses somatic experiencing in her in her therapy. I can't remember the name of the book, but I know, I think I wrote a thing for it, an endorsement for it. <laughs> Thank look you. into that. Thank Take you. Take a moment. My, uh, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, 
also with Tonefeld, with clay, yeah. also uh, uh, about integrating uh, clay therapy with somatic experiencing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, my loves, let's give a round of applause to Dr. Dabla Mata and Dr. Peter Lavilla. Thank you both. Oh, I've got a big heart. Thank you.